how did you get the job driving Johnny Carson as a high school student on uh, a new learner's permit? I was working, you speak about kids. So I was working with um, a tutoring learning handicap kids. Mm -hmm. And the teacher I worked for, her husband was a Harvard Law graduate. And I said I was interested in law. And so she had me meet with her husband at this firm. And the firm happened to be Bushkin, Copelson, Gaines, Gaines, Gaines and Wolf. And Henry Bushkin was Johnny Carson's lawyer. Okay. And I got a job. I, I went in for a law clerk and I got a job as the mailboy. And so as a mailboy, you collect the coffee cups, you you do the Xeroxing, you make deliveries. And then eventually Johnny was in the offices and he needed a quick ride to the studio. And uh, so his lawyer said, well, Mendelssohn will take you. And so I, I had a Chevy Chevelle Super Sport gray with a black stripe up the middle. And uh, so we got in the car and we started driving from Century City to Burbank. And uh, he had his jokes with him, so he decided to do his jokes in the car. And uh, I said, I'm sorry, Mr. Carson, but, you know, He'd gone through 40 jokes. I, I said, I only like these three. I didn't find you know, the other ones to be very funny. And he goes, okay, well, let's try them tonight. Let's see how they do. And I'm going to do these other three and we'll compare. That's all he said. I drop him off. He had a brown sack lunch. And uh, I, I ended up watching it. You know, it was on at like 1135 uh, in the evening. And so we watched it, you know, two of my jokes went over very well that I chose, they were his jokes. And one of his, you know, he had the ability to do his, you know, facial expressions, which made that joke fly. And so that's where the relationship started. And then I thought I'd never see him again. And then I get a call saying, hey, Mr. Carson wants you to give him a ride again. And so, he started using me over the next year randomly when he needed a ride somewhere and he would do his jokes or, or talk to me about what I was studying or I don't know why he liked me, but then eventually he asked me to do this movie for the Christmas show. Cause he heard a rumor that I had an idea for a funny you know, short movie. And so that's where I worked with his editor and cut together what became Bloops and Blunders, which played at that Christmas party, which everyone thought I would get fired. But I mean, I was only work making $4 an hour. So uh, there wasn't that far down to go. And uh, after the lights back went back on, he went to talk to the editor and the editor's like, no, 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 that guy, talk to that guy. And that's where he says, hey, this guy's Warren Littlefield from NBC. He wants to turn it into a half hour show. After New Year's, will you report to their offices and show them how you did it? I said, sure. I think I was 17 at the time. After after all that, what was the transition like going from uh, working in the banking industry to working with Arnold Copelson, uh, the producer of Platoon? Well, I didn't work in the bank industry before. I worked at it after. So I first was working for Copelson and for Bushkin uh, for four years through high school and college. And then went to work for the Olympics in 84 in LA before you were born probably. Yeah. And then, and then uh, I went to work at William Morris agency in the mailroom 
in New York, where, where I lived with a gentleman named Ariel Emanuel, who is, you know, head of Tap Out and William Morris Endeavor, and has made quite a success of himself. So we lived together for uh, two years in New York and three years in Los Angeles. He slept on my couch for seven months when he moved out to L.A. And, you know, we've been close friends as a result. And so, so then I went to a traditional bank training program where I essentially adapted construction lending in real estate to production lending for films. So a lot of the same documentation and concepts were adapted from construction to production. And that's how the bank got into film financing. Well, I, I, I just wanted to know, what, what makes you want to be a part of a film and arrange financing for a certain film? Like what, what makes, what makes what, what's the certain recipe that makes you say, I want to finance and help finance this film? Well, uh, like a recipe, it has multiple ingredients. One of them is the passion of the writer and the director. One of them is the voice. Is it a unique voice? Have we seen it before? It, is it in a genre that happens to be working right now? Like right now, horror is back in style. Um, people are a little bit tired of the Marvel movies, so they want something different, you know? And so horror uh, or comedy uh, use what I call um, involuntary responses. Fear is an involuntary response. You can't help yourself. You get afraid. Or laughter is an involuntary response. You just break out laughing. You just can't help yourself. Uh, you know, like a cough or a sneeze. It's, it's an involuntary response. So sometimes I look at uh, films that have those kind of reactions from people that hear the lines or watch the film. Okay. And... Where do you see the movie industry going after COVID-19 and the uh, Writers Guild and uh, sag after strike? Well, it came back with a vengeance with Top Gun and several of these bigger movies, you know, Kong versus Godzilla, these kind of movies. And uh, I think now people are looking for a little variety so horror provides them with the variety and we've we've gotten away from comedies you know romantic comedies and you know you now suit the super bads of the world and so i think we're, that's the next thing that'll come back and so people want to laugh people want to be afraid and so these involuntary responses again are going to start coming back because the Marvel formula has become a little bit of a uh, predictable formula. You know, it's interesting for the first 20 minutes and then you got some story and then there's 40 minutes of special effects. And it's, I think we want to see those movies like we did, like True Romance, Pulp Fiction, uh, Lord of War, Robin Hood, Men in Tights, um, Sleepy Hollow, Runaway Bride, these kind of movies. And I think they will start coming back over time. Analyze this. These are all movies we financed historically that have performed really well. Matrix was a totally different kind of movie. Air Force One. Uh, and then some more interesting ones like My Life with Michael Keaton and Nicole Kidman. You should check that one out. Nobody's School with Paul Newman. Uh, Henry V, for example, a Shakespeare movie with Kenneth Branagh, you know, which when we were selling it, the Japanese asked us, how did one to four do? And so uh, I said, well, I mean, we're on Henry V. Oh, that's all I can say. Do you think that streaming will soon overshadow theatrical films? I don't think it'll overshadow it. I think it's changed the way we watch movies. 
So it's now acceptable to watch uh, movies on a smaller screen where it wasn't in, uh, you know, when I was your age, you know, to think that you would watch a movie on a phone was unheard of. Now you would watch a TV episode on your phone, no problem. So I think the, the social media, the advent of iPads and, and computers and better screens have created an environment where you could watch uh, older TV shows like Friends or Sons of Anarchy or, or Seinfeld. And it's not a bad experience to watch it on an iPad or a phone or anything like that. So that has created a greater demand for library product. And then there are some films like a Tom Cruise movie that just look great on a big screen like Top Gun. But I've watched Top Gun now eight times and twice in a theater and seven uh, on a plane or, or a television. So, you know, a good movie will survive all the ways to watch it. Yeah. So what, what do you enjoy most about your work and what do you enjoy the least? I, I enjoy uh, giving uh, creatives the opportunity to do their first movie. And uh, I enjoy veterans who have been put in director jail to get them out of jail since they're great directors and have them do their 10th movie. And uh, I like those two ends of the spectrum because they uh, allow for the most amount of business and creativity to give somebody a chance to succeed. And uh, we're involved with one right now that starts on Monday called Dream Quill. And it was written with Alex Prager and her sister, and she's directing and it stars Elizabeth uh, Banks and John C. Riley, and we're confidentially adding uh, Sylvia Botello and uh, uh, several other actors to it. So it's, uh, it's a movie where a first-time director wrote an amazing script about a woman who goes on vacation and is, her family is sent an, a duplicate of her, an AI robot, to take care of the house and her husband and kid while she's away and this robot that looks like her, talks like her, acts like her, ends up taking over her life and she's having trouble getting her life back. Are there any other upcoming projects you have? Uh, yes, uh, we just finished a movie over Christmas called uh, How the Gringo Stole Christmas. It was one of Lionsgate Grindstone's, you know, most successful movies of last year with George Lopez and um, Mariana Trevino about a, a daughter of a Mexican family who brings home a white guy. And uh, Lopez wants a brown Christmas, not a white Christmas. And uh, so it's a story of fish out of water, falling in love with a girl, not from his culture. And, and the father has to eventually figure out that it's the love between her daughter and this kid that's more important than whether somebody's a certain color, race, or ethnicity. Inter interesting. Um, and one last question. Where do you hope your career will be in the next five to 10 years? Well, we've got a really awesome team at the company between Natalie, Caitlin, Gabriella, Jim, Patrick. And so uh, I'm hoping that over the next five to 10 years, um, our production levels double and we're able to make go from making five movies a year to making 10 movies a year. I mean, I, I, I hope to see more of them. I definitely do. Um, and Ms. Michael Mendelson, thank you for your time, sir. I appreciate that. Hey, I really appreciate you. I really love your show. I'm looking forward to seeing this episode and many more from you. You're, you're super charming. And again, from a nation that is 
grateful. Thank you for your teaching these kids because um, you're you're investing in our future, and we we owe a great amount of gratitude to you. So thank you. <laughs>